Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have ecology videos about every monster in the Core Monster Manual for 5th edition, including a lot of lore you may not know from earlier editions of the game. But today, it's time to spotlight one of the creatures from Volo's Guide to Monsters, the magically created shadow thug called the Banderhop. Without word, seldom heard, Banderhobs creep from shadows deep in voiceless night when stars are light upon the bleak and moonless blight. Now, if you first discovered the Band of Hob in 4th edition D&D, you will have been told that they are the creation of drow flesh warping techniques applied to bugbears. In 5th edition, we learn that the ritual for creating these creatures is a secret most often held by hags, who sometimes let this foul art loose on the world, perhaps given over to a cult or some power-hungry mage who will stoop to any level to get what they need. In Dungeon Magazine, issue 195, published in 2011, there is an excellent ecology article by Steve Townsend with illustrations by Howard Lyon and Jim Nelson. The ecology starts off by stating that little is known of Banderhobs, for the wise do not speak of them. They boil from the shadows into the benighted world, and wherever they appear, people vanish, never to be seen again. Then the monsters, too, are gone like shadows evaporating before the dawn or the fading remnants of nightmare. After making so many monster ecology videos, I'm no stranger to conflicting backstories, so let me weave these together and see what we can come up with. First off, Banderhobs are deliberately contradictory. They are engineered to be this way because it scares the hell out of people and makes those who survive encounters with them sound like raving lunatics given to hysterical ravings. This makes perfect sense as the hags and the drow want people to be very scared of them. They want to inflict fear and terror on the world around them because it makes them stronger and makes exploiting the good and innocent people of the world so much easier for them. The drow are taught to believe that the strong have every right to rule over the weak. Failure to assert dominance and constantly seek more power is also a sign of weakness. And as a result, they have created both a society constantly on edge, expecting treachery at every turn and a legendary reputation for their cruelty and evil. Hags are inhuman monsters that only appear remotely like other humanoids because they use that deception as predators use camouflage. To call them wolves in sheep's clothing is an insult to wolves everywhere. Hags are the worst kind of evil. They revel in it. They find acts of depravity and brutal cruelty to be ecstatic pleasure. They are evil for evil's sake alone, and their motives make no sense at all to the good of heart. Except that, philosophically, they know that for the light to shine, there must be darkness. Just as there are the most noble, selfless and merciful beings, there must also be their exact opposite. Banderhobs are the product of dark and dangerous magic that the good of heart would not touch with a 10-foot pole. No one knows where the Banderhob goes, leaving no trace of the place, no place. Just a trackless trail where shadows prevail beyond the ever-darkened veil. In the earliest days of the world, a coven of night hags devised a ritual that led to the creation of the first Banderhob. A hag that knows the ritual might be willing to teach it to another for the right price. Some other dark fae and powerful fiends also know of the process, as do a few mortal mages. Instructions might also be found in a tome devoted to debased wizardry. The drow certainly learned how to make them long ago either through dealings with the hag coven or through knowledge traded with infernal servants and through the dark ma ritual magic of Loth herself, their demon spider goddess. The ritual itself can absolutely be wildly different for every new campaign you run. I encourage you to reinvent its sordid details every time. The original ritual may have involved capturing the essence of a spiritual entity from the plane of limbo, which might explain why the resulting creature looks a bit like a slard, but they are certainly not slard. They may look like a monstrous toad simply because a bullywug is sacrificed or the captured soul of one is used as a frame on which the ritual stitches together profane mixtures of Shadowfell and Feywild power, manifesting a mockery of life form that is both huge and savage but also as silent and stealthy as a waking nightmare. Their tongues ensnare the unaware, their clutching claws crush bones like straws, they bolt their prey and stoop away before the dawning break of day. When the ritual to create a Banderhob is complete, flesh, spirit and shadow somehow combine to produce a creature as big as an ogre, but a lot more intelligent. 
The newly formed monstrosity has long and spindly limbs that belie great strength. Its drooling and broad maw dominates its neckless head and holds a long tongue as agile as a snake, as well as multiple rows of fangs that are as densely packed as a saw blade, both of which it uses to grab and swallow a creature, or perhaps an object the bander hob intends to steal. The tongue is also agile enough to act as a crude prehensile limb slipping under a door to reach up and turn a key on the other side or release a window latch. Despite its size, a banderhob makes very little noise, moving as silently as the shadows that infuse it. Their power to become one with shadows even allows them to effortlessly teleport up to 30 feet from one patch of dim light or darkness to another, as though it was a normal form of movement for them. Now, those of you who may not have seen it, I include a link to a short horror film down in the video description I think perfectly illustrates exactly how terrifying this form of movement can be. Obviously, Vanderhobs can see up to 120 feet in total darkness. Why they put a range on that, I have no idea. A Vanderhob can see as far as it wants to in darkness. So can a Drow for that matter, and the maximum range of a hand crossbow is 300 feet, damn it. Sorry, pet pet gripe of mine. Vanderhobs have impressive athletic skill. They have plus 8 to leaps, climbing and swimming, and if they can't quietly open a door, they are quite capable of taking it off its hinges by brute strength alone. They are very sneaky. They have a plus 7 to stealth checks, and while in dim light or darkness, they can take the hide action as a bonus action, which means they can teleport and instantly hide at the new location, but even more vicious, before or after teleporting, they can make a bite or tongue attack. Thanks to their huge moor and gullet, no banderhob is capable of speech, but they can understand orders given to them by the creator and communicate with nearby banderhobs in a psychic manner. They may be able to telepathically communicate with any hag, even those who didn't create them. There is a lot that is not known about the banderhobs, a lot of folklore and rumour. It might be that the hags don't create banderhobs, they merely summon them and the banderhobs can only stay for a short while before they must return to the plane of shadows. Rumours from the Shadowfell claim that there is a dark tower located past the stormy sea in which banderhobs roam freely pursuing their ominous agenda. It's impossible to find the name of the place, but the Vistani of Ravenloft refer to it as no place. This locale is overseen by an abominable supernatural power that is far from divine in nature. The being is claimed to be the creator of the Banderhob race and commands them to commit their terrible thefts and serve those who summon them. Most terrifying of the legends of this Black Tower are that the Banderhobs built it themselves, with every whispered tale of their existence acting as a brick in its walls, and that through every incomprehensible act of terror they perform, the tower grows in size, as does the reality of their existence. When a banderhob has completed whatever task it was created for, it simply dissolves away into shadowy wisps and a puddle of tar-like slime. There are so many wild tales about them. Some say they were the first elite soldiers of the goblin god Maglutliet. Many fae will tell you that they are the shadow's form of the malicious dimensional folding bogles. Mortal parents tell their children that if they refuse to behave, the banderhobs will come to steal them away in the darkness. It's true that this is exactly what happens. Banderhobs wait for their quarry to sleep before they emerge from places of deepest darkness, the back of a closet, beneath a bed, inside an unlit cellar. They pluck nobles from fortified castles through darkened dungeons, abduct families from city homes where tall buildings cast long shadows, and raid sleepy rural communities to leave behind lonely ghost towns. Young and old, rich and poor, the banderhobs swallow them whole and snatch them all away. With an armor class of 15 and an average of 84 hit points, an immunity to all effects that would cause them to be charmed or full of fear, they have a supernatural power to track down their prey. If the banderhob has even a tiny piece of the creature or an object in its possession, such as a lock of hair or a splinter of wood, it knows the most direct route to that creature or object if it is within one mile of the banderhob. Combat is almost always a deadly fight that comes out of nowhere. While the list of attacks the monster uses is restricted to its bite and wicked tongue, they have an intelligence of 11, two long arms and clawed hands with ferocious strength, so they can absolutely use weapons and objects including whips, nets, garrote wire, massive cleavers, great clubs, hammers, or the body of their last victim. They are large size category and actually one point stronger than an ogre, so if using a great club it would be plus 8 to hit, 5 foot reach doing 2d8 plus 5 bludgeoning damage to one target. If they strike out with their clawed hands, they are plus 8 to hit, 5 foot range doing 1d6 plus 5 piercing damage to one target. However, their mouth 
is far more formidable. Their bite is plus 8 to hit one target within 5 feet, often pulled within range by their long tongue. The tongue is plus 8 to hit like a, uh, a target within 15 feet and does 3d6 necrotic damage, plus the target must make a DC 15 strength saving throw or be pulled within range of its bite attack, and the lightning fast more can make a bite attack as a bonus action on the same turn, exactly like a frog whipping out its tongue and clamping down on a juicy fat fly. The bite inflicts 5d6 plus 5 piercing damage, and the target is grappled, escape DC 15. If it is a large or smaller creature, until this grapple ends, the target is restrained and the bander hob can't use its bite attack or tongue attack against another target. At the next opportunity, the bander hob will try to swallow its prey. The bander hob makes a bite attack against a medium or smaller creature it is grappling. If the attack hits, the creature is swallowed, so it can grapple a large creature, but it can only swallow a medium or smaller creature. Once it's swallowed, the grapple ends, the swallowed creature is blinded and restrained, it has total cover against other attacks outside of the Banderhob's body, and it takes 3d6 necrotic damage at the start of each of the Banderhob's turns. A creature reduced to zero hit points in this way stops taking the necrotic damage and becomes stable, basically locked in a supernatural stasis inside the thing. The Banderhob can only have one creature swallowed at a time, thankfully. While the Banderhob isn't incapacitated, it can regurgitate the creature at any time, with no action required, in a space within 5 feet of it. The creature exits prone. If the Banderhob dies, it likewise regurgitates the swallowed creature. Thankfully, a creature reduced to zero hit points inside the Banderhob will be unconscious for this experience, but that ongoing necrotic damage while inside the gullet is absolute agony. 3d6 necrotic damage per round? That's like getting your arms and legs sawn off slowly. It's sufficient to snuff out an ordinary human being in a single round, maybe a couple if they're unlucky, and slip them into stasis very quickly. You may notice that there is no option for a swallowed creature to inflict damage to the inside of the banderhob in order to force it to regurgitate them. There's no way out short of magic being vomited up by the banderhob deliberately or if the creature is killed. What if the Banderhob has parasites in that gullet? Rot grubs, for instance. What if the victim also had to make a saving throws versus a range of different diseases, even if they got released? What sort of necrotic damage is that? Are they left as weak as a baby when they get spat out? Did it rot their skin and clothing? Is their hair turned grey temporarily? It's entirely up to you, but it is a harrowing experience, no doubt. Also, don't forget to describe to the players the sight of someone their size getting swallowed down this thing like it was a huge shark with arms and legs, and those cold, blank, toad eyes rolled back in their bulging sockets. As reasonably smart hunters, the Banderhob is not above using clever bait to catch its victims. It can't imitate the sound of a captive itself, but they can also kidnap someone and torture them a bit and leave a good, them in a good ambush spot with a lot of shadows waiting as the bait screams and yells for help. Also, don't forget that... Shadow Step Teleport is 30 feet in any direction the Banderhob can see, including up or down. It is unknown exactly how long a Banderhob can survive and remain holding a victim in stasis inside its body, but the thought does occur to me that this may be a way to make an effective emergency exit for an evil wizard, hag, or cult leader. Check out the 4th edition Monster Manual 3 for the variants called the Filch and the Warder for some inspiration, but absolutely make your own twisted alterations to these scary abductors. They certainly don't, don't have to be the same every time. They are magical constructions, after all, if that's the way you want to play them. Or you can play up the different versions of their mythology and origin and culture and folklore that I've mentioned in this video. It's by no means fixed in stone. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, and as always, leave your lights on at night. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.